stop. I will dance. Okay. Yep. Hello, everyone. Thanks for choosing this talk. Today, Olivier and me, we are going to talk on high performance privacy by design using Matryoshka and Spark. Amwi M. Zinlabidin, a Scala backend developer at Moya, and in my free time, I contribute on Zio. And I'm Olivier Girardo. I'm a big data architect, engineer, and co-founder of Latter of Thoughts, a Paris-based consulting company. So today we are going to talk a bit about a privacy framework that we built, giving you a small introduction on recursive data structures and how to handle them. We are going to talk about recursion schemes using a Scala library called Matryoshka and present in depth the free privacy engine that we built with this framework. So what are we talking about? Well, uh, we are talking about user information. We are talking about protecting users' data. This is especially important in the European Union with the GDPR agreement. So what are we talking about precisely when we're talking about user information? Well, here's an example of a piece of data. In this piece of data, there is, well, a few fields. Some are, would be considered important, would be considered user information, and some would be just metadata or not that important. What would we like to protect? Well, for example, we would like to protect the name of the person, uh, her email, uh, her phone number, her address, lane, and maybe the last position we saw her. When I mean protect, I mean that in any company, we need to give access to these kind of data to data engineers, data analysts, data scientists. The goal is to have a clear sense about which kind of data you can divulge and which kind of data you need to anonymize. And when we say protecting, well, there are many ways to protect information. In order for data science process to be able to work, sometimes we don't want to anonymize or hash everything. We want, for example, to uh, encrypt a company uh, with a hashing mechanism, encrypt the lane with a hashing mechanism, but maybe we want to mask the person's name using .xxx file, keeping the first letter or the last letter of a name. And especially for emails, we might want to keep the domain name. So we have many uh, encryption functions that we might want to apply, and these functions are dependent not exactly on the type of the field, because the type is just going to be, for example, string, but on some deeper meaning of what semantically these informations represent. So our goal is to build a generic privacy framework that can dynamically apply privacy on specified fields <coughs> with different encryp encryption functions. When we are uh, building a framework, we need to first clearly understand and get a sense of what we are dealing with. So we are going to use a very usual uh, separation uh, in our domain. We are going to separate data into a data set, into their schema on one hand, and their data itself on another hand. In big data, it's pretty usual. The schema is what? It's the field names and their types, so let's say addresses, which are strings, and the data is going to be like all the raw blobs of data that we are going to store. We do that in big data for many purposes, but mainly to be able to handle schema evolution and to be able to fetch a schema right before billions and billions of records of data. But it's not sufficient for our privacy framework. We need to add metadata, add information that will tell you well, what makes an address worth protecting? What is an address for a person? Is this, is this something I need to protect, or is this something related to a company, for example? So we used, uh, in our framework, we use a specific set of tags that are, well, inspired by the domain of uh, semantic web. So we used LDFS uh, type to be able to semantically annotate our piece of data to say this is, well, this is a person and this is its address. This is a person, this is a email, this is a company, this is an address. So I don't need to protect that. Using this kind of uh, separation between you know, the schema, the data, and 
annotated schema with the tags, we can define privacy strategy in a broader sense and in a more generic way than we would need uh, in a specific data set. Well, we are not going to say, I'm going to protect the name field of this data set. We're going to say, for any given person's email, apply this strategy. For any person's password, apply this strategy. For any person's ID, delete the field. We don't want it to appear anywhere else. This is particularly important. Well, this is the, uh, interest, the, the person interested in law that's talking right now. But uh, the European Union went into great depth into not defining what user information and what personal data was. So this is a way to define what is worth protecting for us. So how can we express such a privacy framework? So using a simple type alias, we're going to say that our privacy strategies are a simple map with the sequence of tags that we want uh, to match and a given privacy strategy that we are going to apply to this set of tags. The privacy strategy is what? It's just a simple contract that is going to define how we are going to encrypt the data, the encryption strategy, but also how this privacy uh, strategy is going to change the schema of our data. Because for example, if we protect an ID by hashing uh, this integer, then it's going to change its type into a string. So we need to reflect the mutation on the schema itself as well. So for example, if we want to apply a certain privacy strategy, which can be useful to uh, data science uh, processes in the end, we might want to protect the specific age of a person by turning it into a category, like young adult, adult, senior, teenager, etc., etc. So how can we uh, build such a comprehensive framework? Well, we are going to create a schema, which is well, pretty usual as usual. We are going to define that uh, any piece of data is whether a struct, an array, or a value. The value is like the leaf part of our tree. It's the end game. It's going to be Boolean, strings, dates, double, simple types. The structs and array are recursive data types. That's to say that a struct has a field name and a recursive T schema, so recursive type parameter. The T array is practically the same thing. In Scala, what does it look like? So it looks like a sealed trait T schema, a simple ADT, where the T struct is going to be the list of field names and their T schema, and the array is going to be like a simple, concrete, consistent element type where the array contains all of the elements of the same type. And the element type is going to be once again a T schema. You've got the leaves node at the end, and we are going to add on every piece of our schema, we are going to add metadata. This metadata is going to uh, contain the semantic tags that we talked about, and maybe some information regarding new label or mandatory fields. Our data is practically the <coughs> mirror concept, because schema and data, they go together. So we need to have the JData that is going to represent the same hierarchy. In terms of types, it's way simpler because it's supposed to only handle the data. So we've got the concrete values, and for the array type, it's going to be the sequence of data. That's the only changes that we are going to have. Spark has practically the same concepts. It has a data type with the array type, the struct type, and the values. And in terms of data, it's a bit more lenient, but a bit more performant. It's going to be a row. A Spark SQL row is basically an array of any, which contains, well, primitive types or rows or lists. And so that's not what we want to be dealing with. We are going to deal with our simple type or types that are type safe, and we are going to create recursive functions upon those types. Yeah, we are going to deal with recursive data structures and in order to apply privacy on specified fields, so we have to implement uh, recursive functions. And recursive functions is about thinking how to iterate the, our data structure and what to do on each iteration. And our data structure is deeply nested and we have two data structures, our schema and the data. So, in order to think about how to iterate our uh, data structure and recurse uh, through this data structure and what to do on each layer, 
this we want to have a stack overflow exception in our mind before we get it in the runtime system. Uh, so we we want to have also a complex code. What we want to do is to focus only on the uh, what to do on each layer, which is what what we want to do is uh, to apply privacy. So there is uh, the best the best approach to do this is recursion schemes, which is uh, described in uh, uh, an, inter uh, an interesting paper and famous paper in functional programming with bananas, lances, envelopes, and uh, buried wire. Recursion schemes is about separating how to tra traverse a recursive structure and what to do with each layer. So we wanna uh, have a ma maintainable code and recursion schemes will automate the recursion and let us thinking only about our business logic. And we are using Scala. There is a functional programming Scala library called Matryoshka that specializes on recursion schemes. It generalizes the traversal, the recursive traversals using anamorphism, catamorphism, ilomorphism, and more. But today we are going to cover what is ana, kata, ilo, those, uh, rec uh, those functions that will uh, generalize our uh, recursion. And in order to understand those functions, we have to prepare our data. And to simplify this, let's take as an example our schema. So in order to, to prepare our schema, we have ingredients. So the, uh, it's our magical steps to follow before we can cook. So our schema is recursive schema, but as a first step, we want to remove recursion in order to make Matryoshka able to evaluate our data structure into a single value of type A. So we will replace our recursive reference with that type parameter, new generic type parameter with A. But what, i what if we want to, uh, to define or describe that A is another schema F of A? And how could we describe a recursive schema F with that uh, new type? And how could we uh, de define a type uh, with a recursive schema F? And uh, in order also to, to think about if, for example, we want to have a function that takes as a parameter a recursive schema F and a return or return uh, a schema f uh, with a, uh, of schema f whatever it's deep uh, so we we need to generalize this type and matryoshka have a fixed point type that uh, can help us to recapture the recursion so now if we want to say our schema is a recursive schema so we can define a schema as a fix of schema F, and we wrap each layer with a fix. In order to make Matryoshka able to traverse our data structure, we have to, to say this schema F is a functor. And we implement our, the map of the functor to traverse the schema F of A to another schema F of B. Now, we prepare our ingredients to be able to use those recursion schemes functions uh, that generalize and uh, automatically recurse our data structure. For example, Anna would recursively unfold or construct our data structure, and Kata will recursively fold our data structure, and Hilo will uh, refold our data structure. So now we are able to start. Let's cook. We want to have three recipes. The first one is to create 
a schema F from a single value of type Spark data type. The second recipe is to fold a schema F from uh, uh, to a single value of type uh, Spark data type. And the third one is to transform a data type to another data type via a schema F. In order to create a schema F from Spark schema, we want to need a function that comes from A to F of A. And Matyushka has a generic function called Anna that will return a recursive data structure, uh, yeah, wrap it in fix, and this data structure should be an instance of type functor, which we already did. Uh, and now we want to have from a single value, uh, from a simple value of type Spark schema, we will get our, what we want to do is to have a fixed uh, schema uh, F. How Anna works, it will build our schema F from a Spark schema from top to down. So then, in order to be able to build uh, and using anamorphism, we need to define our coalgebra. And coalgebra is a function. That function that uh, I mentioned earlier that comes from A to F of A. And in our case, A is a, a data type and F of A is um, a schema F. Now we are able to, to mention our, like in each layer to define our recipe. What we want to do on each layer and then we can cook using Anna and then this will uh, automatically uh, do the recursion for us and build from a single type, uh, Spark data type, to uh, a schema F, fix of schema F. Cool. Now let's move to the, the next recipe. We want to fold a schema F to Spark schema. So we need a function that comes from F of A to A. And Matryoshka provides rec a recursive fold function, generic function called it kata. And how catamorphism works, it will take our data from the nested, deeply nested data. It will start from the long F and fold it to a long type. And then the, deeper, the other deeper uh, type is string F and fold it to a string type and then to the top level. So catamorphism is, uh, will, um, will uh, fold our uh, data type from, uh, from bottom to up. And how, uh, how could we define this? How could we imagine this uh, recursive function would work? How could we take the elements of, for example, if we have an array of a single value of simple values, how could we take them uh, to the next level to uh, to uh, uh, to fold and collapse our uh, schema F? Catamorphism has an algebra, and this algebra is our function from F of A to A, and our F is a schema F and the A is data type, and the magic happens in the uh, type parameter data type because it will keep the, what we did in the previous recursion iteration and then uh, would, uh, would keep it for the next iteration. And now we can define our recipe on each layer, and as we see in, for example, for struct F, it has fields and it will take those fields from the previous level that, uh, that contains uh, the fields in struct F are a list of data type. 
that will contain that will uh, be computed on the previous iteration from catamorphism. So now we can have a schema f and fold it using kata and using our algebra. Cool. Let's see how to transform a data type to another data type. As we, as we saw in the previous uh, slides, we, we, build, we can build a schema f from a value of type data type using ANA, and we can fold a, a schema f to a data type. So we need a co-algebra and algebra. Matryoshka provides a function, generic function, that will do that in one step, which call it ilomorphism. We can call it and we can uh, define our algebra and co-algebra. So cool. Now we understood what, uh, what are our functions that we want to use in order to apply privacy. And for the first, the first priv uh, privacy, that, uh, privacy strategy that we will apply is uh, how to apply privacy in our schema, which was simple to do because we defined an algebra and it will take, it will do the same work and the same logic on each layer. So it, the code was very simple and we call it catamorphism in order to uh, automate that recursion. Now let's see how we uh, apply privacy in our data. So we're going to talk now about the free engines that we built. The, just as a reminder, so we have a map with a sequence of tags that we want to match against uh, the schema of our data, and we have a privacy strategy that will actually do the work. But the thing is that we want to encrypt the data only if the tags within its schema matches those of the privacy strategy. So if we are thinking about very naive approach, we know that we need, when we have a specific piece of data, we need to be able to look at its dedicated schema to be able to harvest uh, the tags and check if those tags are, well, what we are looking for, what we want to protect. So the first very naive approach that we can have to this problem is to zip recursively the data and the schema together. That way that at each level, at each layer, we're going to have two things, the data and the schema. And then we're going to apply just a simple pattern matching that is going to say, okay, well, if uh, for this specific piece of data, I have a specific set of tags that I'm looking for, I'm going to apply the privacy strategy. If not, then just output the data as it was. There, there's no need to secure that piece of data. So how can we do that? Well, luckily, well, it's not luck, but yeah, uh, the uh, Matryoshka uh, framework gives us an NFT. An NFT is basically a pattern functor that from a functor W, in our case, our data F, uh, we, we can put, just right next to it, a label of type E, which is going to be our schema in this case, and it still has that type parameter A. But type parameter A is very important. This is, this is the hole that, that is going to get filled at each computation by the Matryoshka framework. This A is what is going to be the final output. So the NFT is basically a case class, so we can pattern match it to create it, or we can pattern match it to extract the necessary components, and we have access to two methods, ask and lower, which we gives us respectively the label, the label and uh, the functor itself. So for an example, uh, if we have a specific piece of data and a specific piece of schema, which is John McLean of gender zero, yeah. Uh, we have the person name on one side and uh, the data on the other side, then in the end result, what we want is a gstruct f that contains on the left-hand side the schema with its tags, and on the right-hand side, well, the data itself. That's what we want in the end. So using Matryoshka, we'll need to match schema and data. 
but in the real world, well, schema and data might not be compatible. I mean, most of the time, the schema evolutions we make, maybe they do work, but most of the time, if someone didn't follow the rules, when it doesn't work at all. So we need to take into account the fact that when we will be zipping schema and data together, we might have incompatibilities. We might have a specific piece of data that is not nearly related to what the schema is. And so we are not going to output just the NFT, which is data with schema. We are going to output a neither with incompatibility, a simple case class, which will give you the problems you're looking for, and fail. Because there's nothing that we want to output from this framework which hasn't been verified. If you have a specific piece of data that does not conform to the schema, you have no idea what you're manipulating. And the last thing you want is to give a data analyst a credit card. That might sound a bit, yeah, OK. <coughs> so uh, the, the, the zip with schema uh, that we are going to define is actually a very simple pattern matching. As we said, we are only responsible in Matryoshka for giving the recipe for a specific layer. So at a specific layer, you're only going to say, OK, when, when, the, when the schema sp specifies that I'm expecting a struct, the data must be a struct. When the schema specifies that I'm expecting an array, the data must be an array. And that's it. And if anything else happens, then you have an incompatibility. And you stop right there. Well, you don't stop right there. But in the core algebra, you're going to output the left-hand side. That's to say the incompatibility log. So zipping the data and schema, we have the recipe. Now encrypting the data. Well, this time, it's another transformation from this either, which is the first transformation, the core algebra, to a fix of data f, that's to say the transformed data, the privacy data. All we need to do at this point is define the corresponding algebra that is going to extract the schema and the data from our NFT and say, OK, I'm just going to check for the privacy strategies if those specific set of tags ring a bell. And if they don't, then I'm going to just output the fixed value as it was. And if I do, then I'm going to apply the privacy strategy over that, over that fixed value. And that's it. That's our privacy engine. The beauty of functional programming is most of the time you end up doing 80% of the work in the types and in, in before. And then when you have to really do something, then it's quite easy. So we have a co-algebra, we have an algebra. So what we are going to do is to apply it with an ILO. The ILO is going to take as input the schema and the data, because it's as a tuple that we can zip them together and then get the necessary output. And we only need to match the incompatibilities or the end result. So this is a very naive approach. It's quite easy once you get the types right. So. We have a very versatile and generic engine. Are we happy? Yeah, no. We're not. It's not very efficient. So we're going to try to do better. So we're going to build a Lambda privacy engine. The privacy engine is fine. But the thing is that if you have a 1,000 records, then you're doing a 1,000 times zipping the sch schema and the data together. The schema is not going to change. The data is going to change, but the schema gives you the, the recipe. I mean, that, that, the, the whole point of Spark is that the schema gives you the, the recipe. <laughs> so uh, is it just possible to do some kind of runtime lens? That's to say something that is going to prepare the mutation, go down into the data, and modify just what we need? We can do that. We can do that by chaining functions. So we are going to try to build a lambda that will go down into the data according to the schema. And it will be applied. The good thing is that the recursion we did previously is always going to be applied. Because we need to do both algebra and co-algebra to be able to know if we need to do something. But this, this thing, it's only going to, to be run once, uh, checking the schema and checking if there is anything to do on that schema. So if there's nothing to do, then it just, it, it, you can call identity. And that's it. That's over. 
So we're going to define two types of classes. We're going to define a, a trait that is mutation op, and you've got a case object that is going to be no operation, nothing necessary, please don't go there. And the go down operation that will only have two functions, apply to actually do the mutation, and a method to chain another function to be able to get inside uh, the elements. So uh, once again, we have a transformation using Matryoshka, but this time it's not an ILO. We don't need two transformations. We're only doing from a schema F to a mutation. So we are going to call it prepare transform, because in case of, for example, a streaming application, you want to do that at the start of your streaming application and then just apply it for the rest of the life cycle of your application. We're going to use an algebra and a kata that is going to come from the schema to the mutation of. The privacy algebra is once again uh, a pattern matching of all the cases possible, that's to say struct, array, and values. And once again, one layer, and that's it. In Matryoshka, you always assume that the rest of the work has been done for you. So in case of values, then it's practically the same code as before. We're going to just check the schema, check it according to the privacy strategies that we have. But this time we are deferring the execution to later. We are, going, we are creating a go down operation that is going to take a specific piece of data later and is going to apply the privacy strategy using the closure. And that's it. If no privacy strategy was matched, then it's no hope. When you're dealing with the array, remember the all in your functor is always filled with the previous computation. So the element type is now a previous operation. It's not an element type anymore. It's, it's an A, which has become a mutation op. You match the element type. You match what should be applied to the elements. You match it for no op or anything else. And if anything else needs to happen, that means that you've got to secure all the elements in your array. That means that you need to loop on the elements of your array and recreate an array with the privacy strategy previously defined, applied on each data of your array. This is quite simple. It's just unwrapping, rewrapping. And it's, there's no up. If you don't need anything to do with your data, then you don't need to do anything on your array as well, because the array itself is just a container for the data. For the struct, it's a bit more complicated, but interesting. Uh, a struct has many fields, so you're going to check if Every field is safe. If at least one field needs to be, well, needs work done, then you're going to, well, unwrap and rewrap the struct to be able to apply on this specific element the privacy function that it needs to use. So now, according to any given schema, we can now build only once a lambda that will zoom into the recursive data and only go into what it needs to. It's practically the same as uh, a very specialized uh, code that is going to do something like data.get0, get1, get0, get1, and then, ah, yeah, that's what I need. A lens, but for arbitrary data. And it can be serialized and applied many times, so you can uh, serialize it uh, in a Spark process, you can serialize it in a streaming process, you can serialize it and use it when you want. So it's, it's better, uh, we, we, it's efficient, right? Uh, we can do better, because it's still managed by the garbage collector. Uh, who, is not f who is familiar with Spark here? Okay, so in Spark SQL, you've got uh, this really neat engine, which is the catalyst engine, with symbolic manipulation that allows you to define your job and, and manipulate the data and do code gen. That's to say that Spark is going to generate Java code, Java bytecode that is going to be compiled on the fly, sent to the executors, and run. And it's extensible. Not many people do that, but you can, it, it's not a hack, you, you can integrate into Spark a bit more. So for example, in, in an Apache Spark job with millions of records, any of the previous methods will actually generate a lot of conversions back and forth. It will go from, in the worst case, you'll go from a Spark row to a data functor, then a data with schema, then a data functor, and then back to a row, which is 
powerful and it's not really integrated with Spark, so you're breaking the logical plan execution and optimization of Spark because you're going back to RDDs, applying the transformation of the piece of data, then applying the transformation on the schema, then recreating the data frame. It's, it's perfect. So let's do better. The Catalyst engine is, uh, is going to do all these steps to be able to guarantee an optimized logical plan. But if you see at the end, there's the selected physical plan and code generation. We can actually be part of the, that story. We can use the Spark Catalyst to generate ad hoc optimized Java code that will go down into the data precisely the same way we did with the Lambda op, but this time uh, in the unsafe world, that's to say using the unsafe API and, and Java code. It's not perfect, but uh, look at it that way. You're doing highly uh, interesting functional programming to give orders to Java, which is cool. And you're type safe. It's not, but you're type safe. So you're going to mutate it according to privacy and stay as much as possible uh, in the unsafe world. We're going to go there uncharted territory. So the Spark life cycle is pretty straightforward. We are going to go from a schema F to Java code as string, and then compiled by Janino, which is a Java compiler very quick, send the bytecode to the executors and do its magic. So we need a little bit of work done to be able not to lose our mind. We are going to wrap in a value class uh, the input variables that we're going to use, and we're going to define the catalyst code as being something that takes an input variable and generates a string, which is going to be the Java code. And the, this string is going to execute code that is going to put in Java the output of its computation in an output variable that is documented in this case class. So in a sense, the input is given by the outside, the output is given by you. That's it. So, how to create a new expression? Well, uh, you only need the, the children that are going to be the columns of your data frame that you're going to use. You extend the expression. When you have a very simple case, you can extend an array expression, but this is not our case. This is not simple, because we are going to apply it to the whole data set. Uh, is your expression nullable? How does your expression transform the original schema of your data? Which is great that it's in the contract, because we don't have to specify it anywhere else. And we're already prepared for that, because we have all the necessary transcriptions between our schema F, or transform schema F, and the data types. So we need, we need this, and, and Spark is giving it to us. Uh, there's something quite nice as well, which is the eval function. Spark sometimes doesn't rely on code generation, because it thinks that um, it can do better on heap. And this is just basically any of the previous engine that we defined that we're going to apply there. And that's it. But it's not f for the most complex cases. or In production, it's, it's not that what is going to be used. And the do-gen code part. So let's start with the end. The end is what? Uh, we are going to define an algebra, once again, from a schema F, which is the basic recipe. And it's going to generate a catalyst OP. Uh, with its data type, because I need the data type as intermediate uh, computation. I'm, going, I'm not going to use it in the end, but I need it in between. If there's nothing to do, then uh, you've got a very neat Java uh, code between string, which is say output equal input. Don't forget the semicolon, it's Java. And if you've got code, then you're going to call the uh, string generator, you're going to call your method with your method with the input variable that you have, and it's going to generate a huge chunk of code, a block of code, that is going to define the privacy output variable that you can finally assign to your result. So it's cool, but that's the end. Let's go inside. Once again, we are going to segregate between all the uh, different cases, struct, array, values. And the value is uh, practically the same thing. We're going to check according to the schema the privacy strategies. Spark has a very, um, remember, we are doing things on the driver side, but we need to send them on the executor side. So you need to serialize one way or another the privacy strategy that you have and send it to the executor. But luckily, Spark has an add reference object which allows you to transfer uh, code 
to transfer objects from your world to the executor world. This is going to give you a variable, a string, that you can use in your Java code. You're going to safely define your output type, your output variable, cast it because you because that's what we do. And, and then apply it, uh, apply the function in the executor world. This is going to give you your first catalyst code. And then it's always, it's practically the same thing. For the arrays, uh, previous work has been done. Whether you have no ops, that's to say that no code was generated and then you have nothing to do on the array. But if you have code that was generated, then you're going to take that code and apply it in a very neat and very type safe uh, Java loop for loop, Java 1.2 for loop, uh, with uh, the most basic elements that you can find. It's going to apply it, fill a temporary array of objects, and give you the specific output. You're writing code blocks, but with string interpolation, it's not that bad. And the struct is basically the same thing, but on each and every field with the same logic. If there's nothing to do on any of the field, I'm good. If there's something to do on one field, well, this time this is a mutable uh, internal row. So you can just mutate the part you need, sometimes, because uh, Spark relies heavily on the unsafe API, and the unsafe API is memory not managed by the garbage collector. So for fixed size types, you can pr be very optimized, but for arbitrary sized type like strings or another struct, then you need to be more clever. Okay, so we are done. We have our final method that is going to uh, use all the Java strings that we nested neatly together and use it and output it in a final code block that we hope is not too big. It's tough, but uh, at least the data stays in the unsafe world when it's not needed. It can even stay in the tungsten data format uh, when it's of fixed size. It's deeply integrated with Spark, I must admit, but it's not a hack. This is all public API and documented. It's not widely used, but uh, you can do it. And the results are pretty cool because uh, for example, Apache Spark job on a Mesos cluster with 10 cores, five gigs of heap, five gigs of compressed data. The, pr the first engine is basically 70 minutes long. The Lambda engine is slightly better with 45 minutes long and the code gen is unbeatable because uh, you can't beat that. <laughs> it's 21 minutes long. Yeah, data structures and algorithm algorithm are pattern for solving problems and you, you can came up with uh, we can come up with a good solution and elegant solution if you have a good design and in our case we use it functional programming scala library matryoshka and we uh, came up with three uh, engines uh, to apply privacy with a testable code and maintainable code if you are interested on uh, the code, you can uh, check out our uh, repository and we implemented also the test there. And you can also use uh, Matryoshka and uh, try, uh, try it. Uh, also, if you are interested about the idea of recursion schemes, uh, you can check out the paper. And uh, uh, we want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Valentin Casas uh, for his uh, foundation of uh, this design and our colleagues, especially Amin Sagama and Razi Ben Ahmed. And thank you all for your attention. You can follow us on Twitter. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, thank you. Right We're around. Ah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, from your struct type, right, you, I saw like there's float and double. There's also a decimal type for, for Spark as well. Uh, so you're like, talking about uh, the schema that we defined? Yeah, and sometimes say the source schema, 
say I'm using JSON schema or arrow schema f as as the start. It could be like a numeric and certain precisions map to double certain precisions map to yep. like a decimal with yep. different scaling and precision. Will that like affect what you have been doing? Not much. Um, to be honest with uh, with this design, um, in the from an organizational uh, standpoint. This design was uh, is the abstraction of the code. The mm -hmm. first schemas were designed by data management teams in JSON schema. Then they are translated to this ADT, and then we define the transformation afterwards. But uh, any kind of data type that can be represented with Spark, uh, I mean, it's it's not a matter of Spark. Y we are using Spark here, but if mm -hmm. you want to define your, your precise decimal type and everything, you can do it and it doesn't change anything in the code that has been uh, designed. The only thing that might change is that your privacy strategies, your implementation of the privacy <laughs> strategies, uh, we didn't get into that much depth with it, but as you can guess, they need to be typed as well. I mean, you're going to take uh, the, the privacy strategy you cannot apply, uh, I would say, fuzzy, uh, fuzzying of, of GPS coordinates on, on int. So your privacy strategies are going to be well, type safe or checking the input types to check that the data you're applying them onto is actually compatible. So uh, it doesn't change anything to, to the rationale, but the more types you had, the more you need to take into account, and that's it. But a value is a value. So for example, uh, with, with the seal trait uh, T value, most of the time you don't want to get into, the, into what kind of value it, it is. You, you just need to know that it's not a recursive data type, and that's it. And that's the only thing Matryoshka will uh, need, in a way. So it doesn't matter that much. You've got decimal type, you've got byte array, you've got, eh, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK? Yeah, go ahead. Out of that, of that uh, encryption. So the question was: Is it possible to add a salt value uh, to the encryption? Um, we didn't add it to the open source uh, project, but uh, we have something called the privacy context in our implementation, and the privacy context can uh, be uh, well. We'll rely most likely on the target you're going to well target, and and will contain, for example, salts for different business areas or for dis different stakeholders, and and your hash functions are going to take into account this privacy context. So yes, you will need to add that context. We needed to have that context. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was a very useful and it's quite a nice application of the recursion schemes first and the rest of the schema representations next. Um, one thing I have a bit of a doubt, um, you may have clarified, on the second and third schema representation schema calculation, are you actually using a recursive types, a fixed point types, as in the first one? Uh, on, the, on the what? On the schema F? On the second and third solution you have, um, you have first of all Matryoshka. Can you go back or? Yeah, um, the it end? depends on. Okay, let, let's let's be clear on one thing. Um, this design has the T schema and G data that are ADTs. Okay, mm -hmm. but in real life, you if you if you don't have a, a necessary application for these ADTs, if you don't have them in concrete types like in JSON serialization or in schema registry serialization, you don't even need to have them. You can just get and keep the pattern functor, that's to say the schema F or the data F, <coughs> and then, yeah, when you're manipulating those, even if they are you know, intermediary computation types that you're not going to be using outside of the realm of Matryoshka, mm -hmm. then to manipulate them uh, and, and make the compiler happy, then yes, you need to make them fixed. You need to have a fixed data F or a fixed schema F. For simplifying the code um, of, of in this presentation, I sticked to the T schema. We kept the T schema, we kept the G data, uh, but uh, in, uh, in real life application, if these types are not needed, 
then you can just keep the pattern functor form and, and do it, use it as a vehicle for the concrete types that you have, whether it would be a JSON schema or a Spark data type or an XML or schema registry Avro. This uh, schema F, this vehicle, is what allows you, just like you know the hash lists of shapeless, they allow you to transform between arbitrary formats. Mm -hmm. in, in the data lake that we built, they are used as pivot format for going from JSON schema to Spark data type to Avro data type to Parquet data type. I mean, we, we use them as the pivot, the pivot format. So, and if you use the schema F or the data F, the pattern functor form, then you need a fixed point. Whether it be fixed or mu, or there are many fixed points that you can use. We used the simplest one. Any other question? Did, did I answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs>